Hello, my friends, and welcome to season two of Not Defined by Endo podcast, hosted by your favorite endo warrior, Teniola. If you have a suspect endometriosis, then chances are that you've spent hours, days, weeks scouring the internet and looking for answers, finding out you sometimes know more than your doctors, wanting and needing support so desperately, but sometimes feeling all alone and in pain. This podcast is for you. Bi-weekly, I speak to seasoned healthcare professionals who provide their much needed insight into this disease, fellow endo warriors who are conquering the disease daily, and I share what I have learned and I'm still learning on this journey. As you must know, endo is a whole body and soul disease. So I also speak to people who make this battle just a little bit easier by teaching us how to make incremental lifestyle changes or who help us just to remember to hold on to hope. Don't forget that I'm not a medical professional, so everything I share is to inspire and empower you and to remind you that you are not alone. Always speak to a professional before making any nutritional or lifestyle changes. Like, share, rate, and subscribe to this podcast. It means a lot when I receive feedback. You can listen on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or any other podcast catcher that you like. And with that said, let's get right to it. A very happy new year to everyone. It's a new decade, and I'm believing that this decade, we are going to kick endometriosis in the butt. How many of you have heard about Nancy's Nook? I'm betting this was one of the first Facebook groups you heard about when you first got diagnosed with endometriosis. If you haven't, Nancy's Nook is a Facebook endometriosis education resource group with about 90K members and counting. There is a lot of information about endometriosis and its symptoms, research that has been conducted, how to live with the disease, and people can ask questions and have them answered by the admins or fellow warriors who most likely have experienced the same. One of the greatest resources is a list of patient recommended excision specialists with email addresses, websites, and even phone numbers to help reach these doctors. Many of us have had our lives changed by the resources and education in this Facebook group, and I'm so pleased to be speaking to the person behind it all. Nancy Peterson is a pioneer in this field, and I can't wait for all of you to hear what she has to share. So sit back, relax, and let's have a listen. Nice to meet you, even in cyberspace. I know. Thank God for the internet, right? (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Thank you so much for accepting to speak to me today. I noticed that lots of ladies were talking about Nancy's Nook. Nancy's Nook. And I was like, what is, you know, what is Nancy's Nook? And um, I then saw that you had a Facebook group page. I joined and made sure I obeyed the rules (laughs) and I didn't ask any questions. (laughs) I'm sorry about the rules, but you know, with 82, almost 83,000 pages, we have some guidelines. Yeah. No, but I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing. I saw that you had a list of excision surgeons on the group that people knew about. and Yeah, the surgeons come yeah. to us. There are a few that we know personally and, yeah. and know about their surgery, but most of them come to us from patients recommending once yeah. they've had the surgery and gotten a good outcome. Yeah. So that kind of starts that process. Yeah. And then we try to explain to the surgeons how difficult our patient population is. Yeah. Most have multiple treatment failures, lots of surgery, multiple medications. Some have been told to get pregnant, you yeah. know, that kind of thing that you've seen reading, you know, the different histories. Uh, so, you know, yeah, our, our part of our focus is to try to put information in people's hands so they can make better decisions and maybe yeah. get a better outcome yeah exactly totally agreed so the first thing i'd like to know is why has it taken so long for the world to recognize endometriosis as a very prevalent disease 
it affects one in 10 women in the world. And you were one of the initial soldiers, really, or warriors of endometriosis. And, you know, how, why has it taken the world so long to identify this disease or take it seriously? Well, I think, you know, Dr. Redwine wrote a book, David Redwine wrote a book called Googling Endometriosis, and he kind of went way back in history, German medicine, back hundreds, in some case, thousands of years looking at endometriosis. Mm -hmm. However, the last hundred years, uh, much of the treatment has been based on the work of Dr. Sampson. Okay. And he made some assertions about endometriosis that it came from the uterus, was backed up menstrual flow, depositing cells in the, in the pelvis, and that it was a career woman's disease. So if she didn't have babies, she'd be more likely to get endometriosis. And he also um, proposed that most of the disease was black disease on the ovary. So those three things, and then a number of other things over time, have driven care. However, uh, it's not black disease on the ovary. Looking for black disease on the ovary, you'll miss about 75% of the disease. Yeah. Uh, the ovaries, uterus, uterus, and tubes are the least often involved. Most of the time, it's the ligaments, the lower pelvis, the ureter, the bowel, the bladder. Uh, and so when we're looking for disease based on Samson's ideas, we're looking in the wrong place. So yeah. that's one, one problem. Yeah. The fact is that 65% that of women with endometriosis do conceive. Now, those are kind of the lower <clears throat> stage disease people, uh, but even those with more severe disease, like frozen pelvis and things of that nature, their ability to conceive Im improves if the disease is meticulously removed. Yeah. Issue here is that to do that kind of surgery is as complex as brain surgery. And it needs as much education and training. Mm -hmm. And most gynecologists do not graduate from medical school prepared to effectively treat endometriosis. Usually what they've heard is a 15-minute lecture on Samson's work, maybe exposure to the different drug therapies which don't treat, eradicate, or stop progression. But mm -hmm. that's their picture of what you do for endometriosis. Mm -hmm. So they start right out of the chute following these kind of common things, you know, get pregnant. Uh, we'll do a little uh, laser ablation, which only touches the surface, not the deep <clears throat> part of the disease. Um, maybe that it's black disease on the ovary. All of those things kind of guide gynecology uh, these days. Now, that's changing with some of the what they call fellowships in minimally invest invasive gynecological surgery, yeah. and the use of the laparoscope has begun to magnify the lesions in the pelvis, so more people are starting to see them. Mm -hmm. But the common belief that black was a primary color was began to break down in about 1969 when a physician from Arizona identified that the disease actually started out as clear papular disease and over time went through a, a uh, evolution in color appearance right. and so eventually might be black or white or fibrotic but in the meantime there were lots of other colors uh, that needed attention. <clears throat> Dr. Redwine in the 1980s began to meticulously biopsy everything he spotted in the pelvis and confirmed the work uh, by the surgeon from Arizona and kind of develop some of his own. So the idea of what does it look like is one factor about why things have not progressed. The other factor is where is it most commonly found? The distribution of endometriosis is really important. Yeah. And so if you don't know where it's found, you don't know where to look. And the one last thing I would say about that is that the symptom profile is not well understood. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still taking in patients at the rate of six to 800 a week in Nancy Snook. They've yeah. failed everything gynecology has to offer a except expert excision. And they commonly tell us that they've been told that sciatica in their leg, yeah. uh, pain down their leg, back pain, yeah. uh, bowel pain, bladder pain. They've been told that these are not symptoms of endometriosis. So you know, not knowing what it looks like, not knowing where it's found, not knowing the true patient profile 
mm -hmm. I would say has stymied the progression in treatment. Wow. That sounds bleak, but I'm believing that we, your work and the work of many other people like Dr. Iris, that things are beginning to change now and women are, the awareness is growing Right. Yes, I think I think her book is helpful. I think Dr. Redwine's research is helpful. There's a new paper out by a group from Europe and the U.S. combined, which um, kind of touches on a lot of things. But their findings are really uh, not in keeping with what our patients are experiencing. They're saying that wow. you know superficial disease doesn't progress, and that once deep disease is established, it doesn't get worse. But what we see among our patient population is that those patients are in pain, their disease gets progressively more painful over time. Mm -hmm. And when we send them off to someone who does good excision, they usually have significant disease. Okay. So what would you say is the rate of, um, so we know that endometriosis has no cure, but what would, the, would you say is the rate of um, return of the disease if um, you have done excision surgery or for, for your patients? There's, there's several reasons for excision or for endometriosis to recur. First of all is perhaps the surgeon has not been adequately trained on the evolution of color appearance, and so I miss some, or the distribution of disease. Sometimes if they aren't looking in the areas most commonly involved, they will miss yeah. some. Lastly, uh, there is a true recurrence factor. I think Dr. Redwine's work showed about 19% recurrence. I think Dr. Albee in, in Atlanta had uh, recurrence rates under 10%. Okay. And I think that it is related to, for the most part, the skill in, in recognition and removal of disease. Okay. There okay. is another factor. Dr. Uh, Horace Roman in France, about 18 months ago or two years ago, published the finding of true microscopic disease. For a long time, we thought microscopic disease was about the size of a human hair and could be seen at arm's length. But Dr. Roman showed that in his deep, complex surgeries, removing disease of the bowel and deep in the pelvis, that some of the normal areas outside of the disease that they actually removed was seeded with microscopic lesions uh, that you couldn't see until you sent it off to pathology and put it under a microscope. I asked him a question about that. I said, you know, Dr. Roman, will this disease, these microscopic lesions that are, you know, so finely seated and, and can't be seen by the naked eye, are they likely to go on and uh, eventually become symptomatic, large enough to become symptomatic and problematic? And he wrote back and said, no, I don't think so. In my 14 years of following this kind of patient, I do not see that. So I don't know that we know if those microscopic lesions can become uh, a factor. But we do know that disease develops slowly over time. Yeah. So when you go to surgery, if you have everything that you know that you have removed, there's a small chance that over time you will have some new disease develop. Yeah, And usually it, we, in the days now of cameras and videos and all that, they mm -hmm. can kind of identify where they operated on. So when they go back, if yeah. there's new disease right there or in a place before that looks normal on their camera, they know that that's a true recurrence. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, even the best will miss something. So um, for me, I feel like, um, it, like, you know, it took me years, decades to... Um, eventually be diagnosed and I think that that's a mistake that I don't know parents or I don't even know who to we can't put the blame on anyone but the thing is that um, sometimes we know something is not right with our body and because we're so young when it starts and we go to the doctors who are supposed to know everything at least when it comes to medical medicine um, you know we just listen to them that it's all in our heads and I feel like that's also something I experienced. So what now with everything we, we know, what would you say is the starting point for any girl who just knows, maybe she's 13, 15, whatever the age is, and she just knows that something is not right with her body. How should she, what should she do? Well, I think what the, you know, sort of common belief system is that everybody has cramps. Yeah. And everybody has pain. And 
that's not true. Dr. Redwine at a meeting recently said, how much pain should a woman have? How many days a week is pain okay? And his belief system is none. <laughs> and most of us <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> yeah. But um, the reality is that, again, you go back to the education of gynecology about endometriosis, it's lacking. And they don't know that they don't know. Yeah. What I tell, I, I work, we, you know, our, like I say, we have between six and 800 new patients come in a, a week. Mm -hmm. With the parents, I try to work with them when they've got teens. Because um, Patrick Young, who is a surgeon in St. Louis and a researcher and has published a number of papers, uh, identified in kids, if they don't get relief uh, with birth control pills, and that's all we recommend. The GNRH drugs are not indicated for kids. Bone loss is much too great, and there are other factors that they should not be exposed to that. Mm -hmm. But if they get some relief with, pain, with uh, birth control, Mm -hmm. and can live a normal life and aren't laying on the couch with a heating pad yeah. and aren't just depressed and, you know, really in a mess all the time, then they may be okay to go along for a while. Yeah. If the pain begins to break through the use of birth control pills, yeah. that's a red flag that they may have endometriosis and probably should have a laparoscopic surgery. Yeah. Now, in the United Kingdom, they will not operate on these kids under the age of 18, according to the patients that I've talked to. Yeah. And yeah, that's kind of too bad because some of these kids don't get relief with birth control, mm -hmm. and they are living their lives on the couch. And this is the time when they should be developing their personal skills, their educational mm -hmm. skills, their career ideas. Yeah. And instead, they're living on a couch with a heating pad in depression mm -hmm. and in major pain. So we usually say to family members, look, if simple birth control that your gynecologist offered doesn't do it, yeah. think about getting into one of the specialists that we've identified mm -hmm. um, who, who can actually help you sort out the symptoms a little better and figure out if this is endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Now, in our country, in the U.S., they will operate on kids. Dr. Delumba, John Delumba in Texas, I think the youngest he's operated on was eight years old with disabling oh. pelvic pain, and she had endometriosis. For the most part, we're seeing symptoms in age 12 on up. And like I say, if those diseases, those symptoms are not controlled, mm -hmm. Dr. Young, Patrick Young, is, who is a specialist in this area, has indicated once you can't control the pain with a simple birth control, you should be doing a laparoscopy to see what's going on. Okay. So that would be my recommendation. The other warning about that is that diagnostic laparoscopies can be problematic. Mohamed Mabrook, who is a gynecologist at Cambridge mm -hmm. Hospitals in the United Kingdom, in London. Him, yeah. yeah, he wrote a good article for Nancy's Nook about the problem with diagnostic laparoscopies. Very often they're done with one scope or two scopes which is completely inadequate to rule out endometriosis in the most common places, which right. is the ligaments down below and behind the pelvis, the bowel, that whole pelvic floor area can't be seen without a, a more yeah. comprehensive scope. Mm -hmm. So then his idea is once you go in, you should be prepared to surgically address anything you find. Um, I think in the UK, it baffles me a bit because I'm still not sure why it's also very slow. Sometimes I think it's, because of the NHS, the fact that some people won't go private for it for endometriosis centers. So I'm not sure what it is in the UK, but um, I've noticed that even though I'm in the UK and I'm trying to reach out to people, I'm finding it easier to reach out to people like you and Dr. Iris and who are in the US instead. So do you have an idea why? And I will also ask a question about the fact that they are a bit, it seems like they're critical of people like Nancy Nook who try to raise awareness and talk about alternative practices and all of that. So do you know, have an idea why this is the case, especially in the UK at the moment? Yeah, uh, I, I sort of I do. And, and I'm kind of, you know, maybe out of my element speaking for what I see in the UK, but we have thousands of UK patients coming into Nancy Nook yeah. because they feel the system there has failed them. Mm -hmm. There are a number of endometriosis treatment centers there who patients have gone to, who've had surgery with, 
who yep. come away with no relief and their symptoms are pretty classic still for endometriosis. Yeah. There are some surgeons there who work privately. They do both. They work privately. They do private consults and do surgery in NHS systems. Yeah. Um, and so we will sometimes say to patients, maybe you should do a private consult with the folks who patients have identified are getting better outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think that it really boils down to um, what they understand about what disease looks like, where it's found, and how to get it all out. Uh, a number of physicians have worked both in the U.S. and around the world, actually, have put together teams, and they're using urologists, they're using thoracic surgeons, they're using colorectal surgeons, mm -hmm. so that they can effectively address all disease when they encounter it. The resistance to Nancy's nook is, I think, you know, it's widespread. I, I'm not shy about that. I know that's the case. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're teaching patients what are the key factors in the disease and why is your treatment failed? Yeah. And sometimes that gets into physicians' egos. Look, I treated that patient. I know she's fine. Yeah. But when she goes off to someone else, she's found to have Pathology confirmed deep invasive disease. Yeah. yeah. So there's a factor of ego. There's a factor of, you know, it couldn't be that bad. There's a factor of just live with it. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see now more and more doctors, and some of this is led more by surgeons in Europe and UK, uh, saying this is central sensitization. This patient needs some counseling. We need to, to accept the fact that she's going to be in pain the rest of her life. But again, when we refer those patients to people with greater skill, mm -hmm. they find that she has substantial invasive disease. And when you take that out, the central sensitization starts to go away. In fact, there's a pretty good sized study out of China that shows at three to six months, most of the central sensitization issues have cleared up. Wow. There's also a, sur uh, not a, a surgeon, a gynecologist, a professor of gynecology who is probably long retired now by the name of Shirley Pierce. Okay. She, she wrote a chapter in a book called Psychology and Gynecological Problems, and she wrote a chapter on chronic pelvic pain. What she identified from the studies in that chapter <clears throat> was that most patients with chronic pelvic pain had abnormal MMPIs, that's Minnesota Personality Index okay. study. So they were psychotic, neurotic, schizophrenic, on and on. Um, but what she noticed in the studies, were not very many went back and looked at what happened when the pelvic pain was resolved, mm -hmm. whether it was endometriosis or something else. And when those patients were retested once their pain was relieved, in fact, their MMPIs returned to normal. Wow. Even their diagnoses returned to normal or near normal. And so it's been my, I read that 30 years ago, it's been my contention mm -hmm. that the emotional aspects around trying to deal with endometriosis are related to yeah. trying to cope with peritoneal quality pain. Yeah. Once you inflame the peritoneum, it is extremely painful yeah. and extremely difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. And most over-the-counter medications will not help. Yeah. And most doctors will not prescribe narcotics to control it. So that's, you know, the disbelief of patients is another factor about why things don't get better quickly. In the meeting we just came from in British Columbia, the laparoscopic surgeons, uh, special interest group, stated publicly that it appears to them that the status of endometriosis care is in chaos that we do not have standards of treatment that guide people, physicians, other caregivers, to do a better job. Mm. Uh, everybody, there's, everybody has a different belief system about what you ought to do. But for Nancy's Nook and the patients that come there, we're pretty clear that if we get them into certain skill levels in mm. doctors, their lives get better. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, you know the disease is not curable. Actually, some doctors believe it is, and they believe it's curable through meticulous excision. And they say that because they have literally now hundreds of patients out 25, 30 years who've had no recurrence after expert surgery. So it's easy to stand back and say there's no cure. There's 
uh, it's all emotional. You're mm -hmm. never going to feel better mm -hmm. and feel okay about saying that because you believe there's no cure. Well, even if you don't think there's no cure, there isn't a cure. There's a way to make patients lives a whole lot better. Yeah, and that's our goal is to put patients into hands where they can get relief from yeah. the perineal quality pain that, that drives their lives, ruins their relationships, ruins their ability to have children, ruins their ability to have a career. Yeah, fantastic. So now that we know that many doctors are getting on the Nancy's Nook um, excision list, um, do you have any specific advice for doctors who are actually willing? and interested to know more and do more about endometriosis because we know that you know like you said earlier even they don't they just take a very short course or they don't know a lot about the disease what it looks like but i i bet that there are some that are now interested so do you have any specific advice for doctors like that yeah in a way i do uh and bear in mind i'm not a not a doctor i'm not a scientist but i've watched and talked to tens of thousand patients over 35 years yeah. What I see most successful is surgeons who, first of all, listen carefully to what the patients are experiencing. Okay. Don't discount what they're telling you. If they're telling you they've got shoulder pain, when you take them to surgery, put in an extra scope and look along the liver diaphragm yeah. margin to see if there's endometriosis there, because very often there is. Yeah. So, first of all, I think is to listen to patients. Secondly, I recommend that people uh, go to uh, a website called www.endopedia, E-N-D-O-P-A-E-D-I-A dot info, which is where Dr. Redmine's published research is encapsulated. Right. There you find a true symptom profile. You find the distribution of disease, where it's most commonly found. You find information on the evolution of color appearances. Mm. I also recommend Dr. Mark Passover from uh, Switzerland, who is probably one of the leading folks in the, in the field of neuropelvology, which is what pelvic nerves may be involved in pain and how endometriosis pain on organs and nerves and ligaments can actually cause pain elsewhere in the body. So right. beginning to understand it's more than just an achy pelvis will help surgeons. Uh, the last thing I recommend, in addition to distribution of disease, what's it look like, where it's found, is put together a team of physicians who think alike, who are willing to look for disease wherever the patient hurts. Uh, and this team should be gynecologically led. There should be a gynecologist there. Yeah, uh, I see patients often refer. Well, if your bowels bothering you, you might have endo the bowel. Go see a GI. Well, if the GI is not part of a team, there's a much greater risk that the patient may have an ostomy, a colostomy, or, or ileostomy done. And most of the specialty teams don't find that that's necessary. Right. But the the last thing I guess that people can think about are the uh, the MIGS the MIGS programs, which are where they take a fellowship in minimally invasive gynecological surgery, okay. which teaches skills through the laparoscope. I think they're expanding their ability uh, to, to help people recognize endometriosis. It's one of the most common things they'll be doing surgery for. Yeah. So adding those skills uh, to that kind of discussion. Okay. And then, as I said, you know, a multidisciplinary team that can help. Now, they don't always have to go back to school, so to speak. There's yeah. uh, Dr. Ricardo Pereira in Brazil uh, about 25 years ago came to a meeting and said to Dr. Redwine, tell me about endometriosis and doing the surgery. And Dr. Redwine, he talked, uh, Dr. Pereira uh, took home some slides and some videos. Two years later, he comes back with a laptop, much like we're talking on now. And he's got all kinds of surgeries loaded on that. And he sits down with Dr. Redwine and he says, would you look at my surgeries and tell me what you think? Dr. Redwine sits down, starts going through the surgeries, and he's blown away. He said, who did these surgeries? And Dr. Pereira said, I did. Dr. Redwine said, where did you learn to do that? And Dr. Pereira said, from studying, looking at the slides, looking at your research, looking at your videos. And he said, then I just began to go through the pelvis meticulously when patients would come with symptoms 
and look for disease. He has expanded beyond, uh, he's become also an area of specialty of endometriosis on the lining of the heart and on the left side of the diaphragm. Mostly we see it on the right, but some patients it is on the left. It's a more difficult surgery, but he's become a leader in the field, self-taught. That is absolutely incredible. Um, the patients will tell you everything you need to know about endometriosis if you listen carefully. Dr. Yeah. Redwin learned everything he knows about endometriosis in the body from listening to his wife who had it. And while he didn't do her surgery, he saw it to her surgery by somebody else. But he, he, he gives her credit still to this day, his first wife, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, he learned everything he needed to know to take care of patients from her experience. So mm -hmm. listening is critical. Yeah. So in terms of scientific research, I believe every woman should need to do her own research as well and not just go on the, you know, on the internet and just get in access to um, inaccurate information. So are there any, um, apart from the Endopedia one you just mentioned, are there any other like websites or journals or publications or any other source of information that women should be you know, directed towards and going to? Um, it, it's hard because a lot of the journals are closed. You have to be willing to buy memberships to them, but a lot of them you can get an abstract. So okay. you can at least see what the concept is and what they're recommending. Mm -hmm. um, I follow journals being, uh, or articles being published on a, a website called LinkedIn, L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N. And it's for professionals looking for a job. Yeah. But a lot of people post articles there. I, I have kind of a blog of articles there. I have about 120 articles posted there. Okay. Um, yeah. And I also recommend Twitter. Twitter, uh, if you begin to learn about physicians who are interested in endometriosis, a lot of them post abstracts of their articles or of articles they've seen from someone else mm -hmm. on Twitter. So I will go in and do a hashtag endometriosis and do a search and see who said what. Yeah. And over time, you'll start seeing doctors pop up. And so you just click on following them. So you can kind of follow their work there. NCBI is a part of the National Li Library of Medicine here in the United States. Well, maybe it's worldwide. I don't know. But a lot of times when I want to know something about uh, endometriosis, for instance, Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me a question the other day, was something associated with endometriosis? And I said, gee, I don't know. So I went into, uh, just did an internet search, a Google search, mm -hmm. NCBI, endometriosis, and whatever the subject was. Yeah. And you'll get, you'll get uh, articles pop up. The key thing in trying to evaluate articles that are out there is, you know, are they current? You know, is it some, not all older articles are bad, but are you looking for current research? Mm -hmm. You also need to look and see who wrote them. In other words, if they're working for one of the drug companies and the drug company also edited the articles, that should be a red flag. We see that all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how independent is the research? Okay. If, they arm a, if the people doing the research are, are um, uh, advisors to Big Pharma on their advisory board, on their speaking platforms, and then if Big Pharma is coming in and also then editing the article, you should think about that because it may not be as unbiased as it should be. Right. So that's kind of the way I do it. I, we, we get doctors who publish. We have a lot of doctors in Nancy's Nook who publish. Yeah. And so they share their articles with us. Often they'll share the full article, mm -hmm. although sometimes they're hampered by uh, copyright and can't do that. So, you know, that, that can be a problem in terms of finding good information. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, endometriosis Australia, endometriosis Ireland, endometriosis Iceland, uh, endometriosis Canada, the, can let's see, let's see, the Canadian Endometriosis Network, the New Zealand Endometriosis Group, mm -hmm. all of those groups publish good quality information. Okay. And so I will, when people from Australia come into Nancy's Nook, I'll say, you know, feel free to browse here, but you also have an excellent program in Australia that you can join and, and they'll help you find the most current, the most talented surgeons in that area. Mm. Uh, it, there's a certain sensitivity about naming surgeons because other surgeons who think they do well may not be doing well. Yeah. And 
you know, it becomes area of conflict. But most of the time, it's simply that they do not know that they do not know. Yeah. If that makes sense. Makes you know, sense. it's their, they, you know, they're coming from the heart. Their intention is to do good. But if they don't have a command of the basics around endometriosis and what it takes to get a good surgical outcome, yep. it doesn't matter how many times they go to surgery, it's probably not going to work out well. Yeah, very true. So you've mentioned a few of the um, websites, endometriosis, um, you know, Canada and Australia, but I think what is clearly missing is, I think, information about endometriosis or awareness in maybe I'll say third world or, you know, developing countries. What mm -hmm. has your experience been and how can we push the awareness as well to countries where the women don't have, you know, as good as a medical system as um well, this is a really sad part of this job for me. I hear from people all the time from third world countries who are in agony and who really have really severe disease. And if they do not have the financial ability to travel uh, to another country where we know there's an expert, we don't know all the experts in the world. I'll say that right out front. We don't know them all. Yeah. But we're constantly looking and, and, and helping to hear from patients who get good outcomes. Uh, but it, it's a very difficult thing. All we can do is teach them what they need to know so that when they go to the doctor, they can listen for red flags. Gee, this person sounds like he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Or, she, or this person is saying things like, get pregnant, we're yeah. going to take out your ovaries, all that stuff that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, so often patients are said, you need a hysterectomy and you need your ovaries out and you'll be fine. Endometriosis will die up and uh, dry up and go away. That's not true. Yeah. Endometriosis often makes its own supply of estrogen. So yeah. it doesn't matter that you don't have ovaries and you aren't taking estrogen. You can still have progressive painful disease. Yeah. But for the people in third world countries, I, my heart aches for them because I don't always have good help mm. to, but to send them to. But there are more and more physicians now who are not necessarily Nancy's Nook physicians, mm -hmm. but they've been recommended to come to Nancy's Nook to see the kinds of problems and struggles that patients in their countries are having, yeah. which may in the long term begin to help them change practice when they see how difficult lives are. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of physicians in Nancy's Nook who, do not, who are not on our list of surgeons. Yeah. Uh, and who come mostly, uh, well, one of the meetings I was in in British Columbia, the speaker said, sign up for Nancy's Nook so you can see what patients are going through. So there's been kind of a surge of physicians from all around the world join Nook so they can see what the patient's true experience is. Right. Over time, we hope that we're going to change the whole world. But, yeah. you know, we've been at it 30 years. Dr. Redwine and I, and, and many others as well. But we know that it takes time. A professor from Stanford University, Paul Altrocki, I think he was assistant professor in neurology, told Dr. Redwine when his work was first published, Dr. Altrocki read it from stem to stern, and he said, you know what? He said, it's going to take 30 years for these ideas to be accepted. And this was 32 or 33 years ago. Well, what I didn't yeah. understand was that it didn't mean fully integrated. So mm -hmm. understanding what it looks like, where it's found, you mm -hmm. know, the color appearances, you know, all of that has taken time to be integrated and it isn't fully integrated, but it's coming, you know, 30 years ago, there were only just a few doctors trying to excise endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Now there's more than ever. I mean, it's, it's a growing field. Yeah. That's good. On these and I hope for the third world countries that that will be helpful. They don't have to have an, a, 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 a robot to do good surgery there. All they have to have is a laparoscope. And most of them uh, have been obtaining or have laparoscopes and have had them for a number of years, laparoscopes. Uh, so part of it is just curiosity. What's it look like? Where is it found? What happens if I take that out? That's exactly what Dr. Redwine, how Dr. Redwine started. Right. Okay. So I, I have hope for underdeveloped countries, but I know it's going to come slow. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks to Nancy's nuke, 
um, lots of access is what we need. And you mentioned something about doctors also joining, which is fantastic. I never thought of it that way. But I think one of the things we can do is also raise awareness to doctors as well, um, not just patients or people experiencing it, but doctors. So they get in there and they understand the disease and begin to improve you know, their expertise. So that's really good. Um, while you were talking earlier, you mentioned um, being careful about research that uh, may be sponsored by Big Pharma which reminded me of something I was going to ask you about what you think about Lupron and or release that. So drugs like that, what are your views on, you know, being given, giving patients that, for example? Okay. Lupron um, was a drug developed originally for prostatic cancer. It wasn't developed for endometriosis. Wow. Uh, eventually, um, the idea was patch that we should look at applying it to endometriosis. And there were some studies done and then the drug was rolled out to treat endometriosis. It doesn't treat endometriosis. It puts a patient in a low estrogen state and shuts down the ovaries. The problem with Lupron is that their original study data was reviewed in detail for a court case. And that original study data was never fully released to the doctors or to the patients about the drug or its harmful effects. So when the study was completed, the company, instead of challenging the person that did, the, did review their data and said there's something wrong here, they got a court order and shut it down. So the faults and the problems could not be spoken about. They couldn't be published that 62% of the patients who take Lupron lose their ovarian function permanently. It doesn't come back at one year. And, they, and once they discovered that, they quit following that. They don't follow it anymore. Right now, on GnRH type drugs, Lupron and the others that were developed similar to that in other countries, have over 40,000 complaints filed with the FDA. Wow. The memory memory issues, cognitive issues, permanent bone pain, permanent bone loss, different than bone pain, um, small vessel heart disease from being in low estrogen states, all over a drug that does not, in fact, treat endometriosis. It doesn't eradicate it. It doesn't stop its progression. It doesn't prevent recurrence, at least as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. And if you look at ACOG, or the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, if you look at their practice bulletins, that's, they confirm that suppression of the ovaries does not eradicate disease, doesn't stop progression, doesn't stop recurrence. It may help with uh, recurrent cysts of the ovaries simply by slowing or stopping the cycles. Mm. Lupron, by most patients, uh, like I said, if you look at all the different preparations of GnRH, there's over 40,000 complaints that were filed with the FDA. And the true nature of the problems with the drug was hidden by a court order. So patients and doctors never had a chance to have informed consent. The patients in Nancy's Nook seem to, almost all of them seem to object to the drug. Their experience has been very negative. Yeah. Uh, and many of them have identified that they have permanent, long-lasting side effects from the drug. Um, and it's not well documented because it was hidden. And now they're out with a new oral drug called Orlissa or Elagolox. Um, I don't know too much about that, except it's very expensive. Okay. It's no, I do know it's no more effective than a birth control, which, you know, you can spend $800 a month for Elagolax, or you can spend 50 or under 50 for birth control. There have been some ovarian losses. We have several patients in Nancy's Nook who reported, this self-reporting, but who reported they were working with a reproductive endocrinologist, and while they had been on the drug before they started to try to conceive, their ovarian function stopped and has not returned. There's also been uh, <clears throat> several cases of liver failure in our group of patients, and it is reported in the literature that that's a risk factor. We've not had any suicides, but there have been uh, a number of suicides or suicide attempts reported. So that family of drugs, uh, 
do not have a lot to offer, but they're heavily marketed. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think most doctors are too busy to realize that some of that is creating permanent things like permanent bone loss, permanent ovarian damage, mm. you know. So, and the other thing about ovarian suppression is we do it now in the here and now. We say, here, take these birth control, take this GNRH, take Lupron, you'll feel better. And sometimes patients do feel better in the short term. But what we do is we push the potential side effects on down the patient's lifespan. Yeah. So now at 45 or 50, they got a broken hip mm. or they have small vessel heart disease or they've started developing cognitive issues. Mm. And that is not being well explained to patients at the time the drug is prescribed. Yeah. So whoever the prescriber isn't going to follow them throughout that lifespan. They just prescribe it now because you'll feel a little better. And, and the, when we push the problems on down the lifespan, yeah. somebody else is going to have to deal with them. Yes. Yeah. And they, it's not necessary in most cases with expert surgery, the symptoms can be permanently or nearly permanently resolved. Okay. So people just have to know and continue to know that Lupron or Relisa is not, it's not a cure and there's been negative reviews about them. A good drug for moderately severe pain with sacs or, 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 or invasive disease in the lower pelvis. But when they published that, they left off their own data that showed that it not only did not work, but in some cases, the pain got worse on the drug. So, and that paper was partially written by a person who worked for Big Pharma, and the paper was edited by Big Pharma. So, I don't know what to say about that, except that it, it is not a miracle drug. It is not a treatment for endometriosis. It may suppress pain for some patients, but it didn't work as well as we were led to believe. So do you have anything else to say to both endometriosis patients and their doctors all over the world? I, you know, the biggest thing I think for patients is if you're not getting the help you need, go someplace else. Patients come in to Nancy's Nook all the time and say, how do I get my doctor to do excision? He's doing ablation. And I've had three of them, and I feel awful. You can't. A doctor who does excision has to be trained. And if you go into a doctor's office and he's not doing excision, and he doesn't ex he's done three ablations, and he's not suggesting excision, he hasn't been trained. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep doing the same things you've always done, you're going to get the same outcome. So you really have to to think about, are they trained to do what you need? Um, I think that's one thing. Is you, you need to go someplace else if you aren't getting what you need. I think continue to educate yourself about the disease. Uh, there are people who challenge our teachings in Nancy's Nook all the time. And the literature is changing. You know, the research brings new things in. But there are some common things that endometriosis is painful. Endometriosis, if you find it and remove it, relieves pain. And even though there, then there may be other pelvic pain generators, such as bladder, uterus, pelvic floor, those need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But as far as endometriosis, the best approach is to get it removed by someone who knows what they're doing. So for doctors, listen to your patients, believe them. If you don't feel like you are comfortable removing the disease where it is, find a referral center and send the patient on. Their lives are very difficult. Yeah. And living with peritoneal quality pain is no, is no fun. And I, I have said, for the most part, endometriosis is not a fatal disease, but despair can be. And we lose women every year to yeah. suicide because they can't keep going on. Yeah. So don't give up. Find another doctor. Learn, learn the key factors about endometriosis, about what works. And, and keep looking till you find a practitioner who can do that for you. Thank you so much, Nancy. It was great having the phenomenal Nancy Peterson on the show today. She has been fighting this battle for over 30 years and is helping both patients and doctors to understand this disease. I know that as we all continue to come together to fight and raise awareness, 
more women will be able to reclaim their lives from the pain of endometriosis. If you have a suspect endometriosis, please visit and join Nancy's Nook on Facebook. There's so much to learn and so many connections to be made. You just might find your excision specialist through this group. Also, you can find lots of articles on LinkedIn, endopedia.info, and even Twitter. Make sure you verify your sources of information as well. Make sure it is an independent source and not edited by companies with vested interest. If you're a doctor interested in endometriosis and want to learn to identify and manage the disease with your patients even better, please reach out to Nancy. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I would love to know. Send me comments or even a DM through my Instagram or Facebook page. Share with your friends and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have any other questions to ask or topics you would like me to discuss, feel free to shoot me an email on info at notsdefinedbyendo.com. I love to hear from you all. All of this information will be found in the show notes. And until next time, my name is Teniola. And remember, you are not defined by endo. Endo.